Hi, welcome to this week's Telehealth Secrets webinar. I'm sorry we're two minutes late. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we do have slides and a handout for you in the handout section, so those can be downloaded. Um, we'll also send the slides afterwards. Um, you can send, you can type in questions that you have for uh, Dr. Sadegian or for Milton anytime that you want um, from the chat. And the session will be recorded and sent out following this webinar. And also we have more resources for you um, on reimbursement, telehealth grant funding, and uh, just getting started. And you can check those out at bc.com slash webinars. And I'll also put that in the chat. So let me go ahead and pass the time over to um, Dr. Milton Chen. Thank you so much, Shan. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, welcome everyone back. I hope you guys all have a happy New Year's. This and uh, uh, we're at the VC uh, telehealth. We're definitely pretty excited. We're just seeing a lot of activity, interesting thing, both on the technology and the plus the big market forces. You see things like, you know, Roman Hems, all these are huge company. You know, like uh, make a big movement on the stock market impact and so on. Uh, then today, I'm really excited to welcome our guest this week, Dr. Regulated Sertigan, so the Chief Medical Information Officer at Arrowhead Medical Center in San Bernardino, California. So the doctor is a practicing pediatrician and a physician technologist who's really passionate about using technology and reimagining how healthcare uh, could be done. Um, again, all of you can see he has long list of credentials, which is really, really impressive. But some interesting thing that you might not know about him, he's an avid photographer, loves to travel to remote places like seeing a sunset, maybe as early as 4 a.m., maybe a sunset that's late at 10.30 uh, p.m. Again, when I saw one of his shots, you know, it was just like really amazing, uh, amazing stuff. I guess, how about maybe before we start, Dr. Maybe can you just share with us how did you, uh, you know, get started as a photographer? Maybe I ran out of COVID, you know, we all get the vaccine. Where be the first place you're going to go to? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Chan. So, uh, first of all, hello to everyone who is on the uh, YouTube podcast. Yeah, so, you know, as part of our journey to be a physician, we tend to travel a lot, right? You're going from hospital to hospitals. Uh, and you know there are different rotations that we have to do but even prior to that <clears throat> um, one of the best ways to see uh, you know how beautiful our country is is to have a road trip and you know america is great is you know we have a lot of beautiful sceneries in the country and you know when you fly you don't get to as to enjoy as much as when you drive so uh, over the past 20 years uh, I was lucky enough to be able to move around, whether it was education or work or or, or traveling, and um, uh, we didn't have such a good cameras on our phones. And and usually when we used to take a picture, we want to print it and put it on the wall. There was no social media, right? So you you got to get at least a good quality of point and shoot. Uh, so and everywhere that I was going, I really like to capture those as a memory. So that's 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 how I started. Uh, with the uh, photography and now in the digital world, um, you can take as many pictures as you want. You know, you, you know, it's not a film era that uh, you basically uh, burn the, the film. So that's how I got into uh, taking pictures. And the more you go around and the more you learn about uh, uh, the photography techniques, uh, it really became my main hobbies after hour of my practice. Um, awesome. So, can I ask, what do you, what do you use a phone camera now? Or do you use a actual professional camera now? Yeah. So, um, I have the professional camera uh, with me every day because you you never know. You're driving on the highway in California and you see a beautiful sunset. So I pull over, try to find a place. But I also I use my phone to, you know, uh, capture uh, just a day to day. Uh, uh, we even have our own uh, uh, photography videography room in my department, which I take pictures of my staff. So I carry my professional camera with me every day. I have five cameras, 
Wow. And so I usually carry the smallest one. Uh, but now with uh, the software transfer, you can take a picture on your professional camera. So you have the file if you want to print out on, on, a, on a larger uh, size, but then you can transfer also to your phone. So I use a combination of both. Okay, awesome there. Thanks for sharing these. How about this? Maybe I'll turn the floor to you to share your insights and then later on we open up to the audience for questions. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So as Dr. Chen mentioned, my name is Dr. Sadegan. I'm a Chief Medical Information Officer. Uh, I'm also Assistant Professor here at the Overhead Regional Medical Center and also Medical Director of Clinical Informatic Department. So today I want to run you through what we did at Arrowhead using the BC technology and uh, basically give you a little bit of background. Um, over 10 years ago, uh, I, I worked at the University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Medical Center. And that's where I did my first fellowship in biomedical informatics. But um, at the time, there was a lot of discussion about telemedicine, especially in the skills nursing facilities. So we rolled out uh, a pilot study in our five skilled nursing facility. We built the technology from scratch. It was quite expensive at the time to even purchase one telemedicine card. So University of Pittsburgh uh, had uh, enormous resources in terms of software developer and technology, and we were able to do that. And one of the things that uh, we did as part of our pilot and really learned is how do we go about building the platform, building the technology, you know? Most of the institution, uh, you would see that uh, uh, their IT department takes control of the technology purchase and have the stakeholders uh, utilize it. What we learned was that <clears throat> how do we go about uh, a complete uh, 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 project planning and processes? So one of the things that I did at uh, Arrowhead prior to uh, embarking on our journey with telemedicine was we created a telemedicine committee uh, where we had a number of uh, executives and physician champion on board and really start looking into what do we need to do here. So we start working our initial planning. We start looking at what are some of the areas that require to use the technology. We did uh, an extensive evaluation of uh, clinical practices. Uh, we look into our uh, uh, revenue cycles, right? Uh, are these services that we're going to provide support for um, uh, are uh, reimbursed through an insurance or Medicare program. So we look into all of those before we even look into technology. As we were evaluating those at the time, obviously, we were interested to see from the clinical operation, what do we need to accomplish, right? When you uh, have a patient that are coming to the hospital, we're looking at registration, we're just looking at the scheduling, you know, we're rooming the patient, right? Uh, what kind of providers are, 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 are going to provide services. So we're looking at an entire spectrum of a normal clinical practices. And what are some of the areas that we can replicate to technology? Then we're looking at the clinical workflow assessment. Uh, what is my care in a state? If I'm going to look into my family medicine, my primary care, my internal medicine and pediatrics, uh, what, are some, what is the care in a state? And how is the technology going to help me? Or is there any room for improvement as part of my future state that I can leverage the technology? The third part was, are, is our IT ready for this? Do we have an infrastructure? If you're going to use this through, for instance, as simple as are we going to use the Wi-Fi or are we going to have to use some of our desktop to provide the surface? Are we going to use our portable cards on the floor? Um, do we have infrastructure and bandwidth that can do it? Um, as I mentioned, we look into our revenue cycle assessment. Are these services under uh, the state uh, uh, handbook for the telecommunication services are uh, reimbursable? Uh, what do we need to do from the HIM and documentation perspective? Because now this is not a uh, full-blown visit. This is uh, uh, going to be done through the telemedicine. So as you can see, as part of our initial design process, we had to get a number of individual uh, engaged in the process. And once we evaluated the majority of this section, we went about 
who is going to be the best vendor for us? And, and, and we chose BC for that, uh, for the reason that um, it really fit our clinical practice here. Um, so I wanna share with you our overall implementation workflow. So we were looking at how are we gonna, how are we going to use the telemedicine technology? Are we going to use uh, in our call center? Uh, are they gonna be the one who is the schedule of this patient? Again, going back to that full workflow analysis. Uh, are we going to use it in our outpatient clinic uh, or inpatient? So when we look at the technology uh, and uh, we settle with, with BC, we look into what are some of the priorities for our institution. And um, coincidentally, it was the same time that we hit with COVID. So as we put our telemedicine community together, which was about uh, November of 2000. 19 and we were going through the process uh, uh, all of a sudden we hit with COVID in early 2020 so we had to really expedite our evaluation and, and put a telemedicine work in place and we divided into various phases we start with our clinical so we again we look into our clinical practice how is our current estate we have a physician we have nurse practitioner we're academic medical center so we have a uh, large number of residents and fellow. Uh, so those are our frontline providers. How is the current workflow? The patient comes to the clinic, the uh, CA or medical assistant room the patient as, after they've been uh, registered in the front desk. So how can we replicate that without disturbing the workflow? Because some of our challenges are we're introducing technology. Uh, I wanna be as close as to the current clinical practice, but also we're facing COVID. So uh, we need to make uh, some adjustment because of the situation that we're at with COVID. Um, so we divide it into various phases. We, start, uh, we started with our outpatient clinic. We had about uh, 33 uh, uh, virtual rooms that we created across the specialties. Uh, then on the next phase, we uh, want to roll out to some of our inpatients. So we engage our psychiatry, some of our consults. Uh, then we also hit with the uh, uh, visitor, visitor limitations because of COVID patient. So uh, we provided these resources for our nurses. If, if they're going to want to have uh, their family seen through the, through the BC platform to use that. Um, then we also face with our detention center. We have number of inmates that they come to the hospital. You know, we are a county hospital. And so the transportation was an issue. We also want to reduce the uh, risk of, uh, you know, uh, uh, virus transmission. So how are we going to go about that? So that was another phase that we worked to implement the technology in our county. So some of the follow-up patients, cardiology, follow-up surgery, uh, you know, were done through uh, the BC platform. Uh, as we start to grow and more and more and more uh, then the, uh, we were contacted by various departments in our county. Uh, the, the current work that we're doing right now is to uh, expand the platform into our 54 skilled nursing facility. And that is through our Department of Adult and Aging Services. So we're not done yet, uh, but uh, um, I, I, as you can see on the screen, to just share with you some of the statistics, and, and uh, to me, it's quite remarkable. You know, we, we launched the technology in late July, beginning of August, and getting 33 virtual clinic on board in a very short time when you're understaffed, when um, a lot of physician leads ha ha had to go to a number of COVID-related uh, meetings, uh, a lot of issues across the, the nation with the uh, shortage of PPE and uh, being understaffed. I think our hospital did a tremendous job, our providers and our administrators, they did a tremendous job to, uh, you know, align with my department, clinical informatics, to really push for this technology. We had over 552 sessions uh, in, in, in the remaining of the year uh, and uh, uh, over 4,800 uh, minutes of service. In 2021, we added uh, one additional clinics in addition to, as I said, expanding to 54 skilled nursing facility that are rolling out actually this week. Uh, so we have uh, 
uh, we we have had so far about 151 sessions, uh, and and the numbers are growing. So again, I got this number yesterday, and if I log into our VC platform, I'm sure those number has gone up since yesterday. So uh, our physicians are very receptive uh, to the technology, uh, very receptive to uh, the technology, and they're really, really wanting this to expand across our institution. We're also getting some feedback from other uh, county department in addition to the detention center that re really want us to uh, help with that uh, platform. As a pediatrician, I, I, I still practice. I think that is very important to be a physician, uh, informatician and practice and basically um, bring uh, something to the table that I myself would be the first one uh, who, who use that. It's like our COVID-19 vaccine, right? So uh, who's going to be the volunteer to use it? And uh, so I just want to share with you a story that it, it happened uh, among many stories a couple of weeks ago. And I, I had a patient that uh, uh, the mother uh, had uh, COVID and uh, unfortunately she wasn't really doing well. So when the baby is born, uh, they had to have the family to uh, uh, take care of the child. So they wanted me to talk to mom via phone. Uh, so it's part of our phone visit. So when I called them and I uh, talked to uh, the mother and I said that, you know, we have a video visit and if you would like us to set, uh, send you the link, you're able to come online and I can see you and the child and say, well, the child is not with me. The child is with the family member. I said, that's fine. You know, you can log in and uh, we can start a discussion, and then once we start the session, I will uh, ask you to uh, send an invite to your uh, uh, family member and send them the link. And through that link, they they're able to join. So, one of the great things about VC is that uh, once we start a session with a patient, there's going to be associated link uh, and a pin with the phone number that you can share with uh, additional people. To my knowledge, up to ten. Uh, and so what we did, uh, 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 mother shared that link with the family and they were able to join the call. And we had someone similar to the picture I posted on the screen, a three-way call. So not only mom was able to talk to me, I was able to talk to the family member, see the child, and also mom was able to see the child. So I think this is just one of the many example out of those 500 plus sessions that we have that how such technology can help us even during this time. Another example that I can share with you is that the emergency medicine, um, uh, usually with the emergency medicine workflow, physician come to work and finish their work and you know they, they go home. Uh, so there's not much continuity of care. With COVID, uh, uh, sometimes when people come and, and uh, we uh, test them for COVID and uh, for, uh, for whatever reason we send them home, uh, that they don't need to have an inpatient hospitalization, um, they want to follow up on the result. Obviously, we have a patient portal, but due to our, some of the challenges with uh, our pop patient population that we have in terms of uh, um, uh, technology and, and being able to get access to our portal, uh, 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 so we follow up with, their, with them through the phone call. And one of the uh, one of the things that uh, our emergency department really want to do is that, especially during this time of uh, pandemic, uh, it's better to have a face-to-face -face visit with family rather than just a phone call that, hey, your test is positive or negative. So for a lot of our uh, follow-up uh, calls, we actually use the VC platform and we have received a tremendous positive feedback from our patient that is a lot more reassuring, even when we're having uh, uh, to call them just to give them a test result, uh, especially for COVID, uh, we can sit with them face to face. Our residents, you know, grab a room, uh, send them a link. They come online and talk to them. And if they have any further question, you know, if their test is positive, you know, and and they have question, are you symptomatic? Are you not? What are the next steps? So we found, we realized that the value is significant when we when we set up a video session instead of just having a phone call to, uh, to even discuss about the simple lab result. 
So this is just a quick overview of uh, what uh, we have done with telemedicine here at Arrowhead. So I'm going to pause here and open this to discussion with uh, Dr. Chen and the audience. Great, Doctor. Thank you so much for sharing insight. Really impressive what you have done. And I think as we're gearing up for open up question, we're going to do a quick serve, quick poll uh, for the audience members. Um, and the reason we have this poll is really just to uh, uh, <clears throat> give you a sense, uh, audience, you know, just what level of, you know, telehealth ex expertise you have, and have you guys started like try something? How many different systems you have tried? And, so on. and we'll give you a couple of seconds to do this. Um, And great, and then uh, Anne will share the results as soon as we process this. Now. And um, I think, Doctor, um, it was really uh, exciting to see you. You guys did a lot of planning before you actually dive into telehealth. I know a lot of the. Um, oh, great. Okay. Okay, so this is actually great to see. It seems like uh, quite a bit of you have quite a bit of experience in telehealth in this. Yeah, this is by the way, we will also see this in the general markets when we survey with a client we work with. People tend to start out with something like Zoom or Microsoft Team and they're able to jump back into, uh, you know, like the exploring the different way to go just beyond video to actually have these for more like telehealth workflows. Um, um, thank you, Sushma. Again, um, uh, Dr. Um, I was so a lot of the people in our audience members, they're really interested in the practical side of implementation in there. So what, um, how much planning did you do before you actually dive into this? I was just curious, is like, is this something that took, is it hours or days or just how much time do you, it, until you felt like you have all the pieces in place? Yeah, so as I mentioned in my very first slide, um, mm -hmm. I I spent I spent a few weeks uh, talking to our yeah. department leads, and uh, I tried to focus on the primary care first. Okay. Uh, and I, I also, as I talked to their department chair, I asked them what they think about uh, some of the usability of technology. For instance, if I'm talking to general surgery, I asked them if. Uh, they think that there's any utility of this in some of their uh, uh, subspecialty group. And I took their initial feedback, and uh, if I needed to go and talk to the subspecialists in more detail, I talked to them as well. Um, so I would say, you know, since November of 2019, I spent about two months trying to really get a good grasp on the, the clinical workflow assessment and, and, and their needs before I even look into the possible vendors. Got it, that makes sense. So we have a question from the audience, Don. Uh, so she's asking, so are you seeing any issues with the elderly and their understanding of how to join a virtual uh, session? Yeah, so one of the reasons that uh, I, I, I had in mind for the technology is that I wanna make it as, as simple as possible for our uh, patient population, because th there's an elderly population that we have, but also we have uh, uh, people that are not really tech savvy in, in our patient population. So these were always in my mind, and we try to eliminate some of the obstacle. For instance, mm -hmm. if if there is if you can uh, eliminate the need to use any applications, that is a plus. Mm -hmm. Uh, which means that if you have an in-browser uh, login, that is going to help tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one reason, you know, again, with the VC, you have an option of both. And since our workflow was very simple, you just click on the link and, and get a session. Uh, now, if I'm following with a patient with a congestive heart failure, and uh, as part of the training, some of the things that I told the care assistant and MA was, if you can get a family member with them for the first time, that is going to help them out. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, as part of our training, we taught them 
how the patient interface look like so then they can troubleshoot for them so if you are calling the uh, you know 70 year old and they want to be on a video call with their doctor um, you need to troubleshoot at least the first time you know when they go through the link okay click over here okay what do you see on your screen first name last name date of birth right and they, they, they try to stay on the call and troubleshoot with them. And they, they get them on the platform and then they hang, hung up on the phone. And then the second time it, it became easier for them. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, Raluk is asking, so how were you using this sort of telemedicine you know, uh, in terms of, of during the COVID within your hospital? And also then the second part of the question is, is that like after COVID is gone, what, how do you see it used like outside of the pandemic? So for, that, for our inpatient setting, um, we use it mostly for our consult. So for instance, if, uh, if, if, if they want to get a psych consult and we want to reduce the face-to-face um, uh, -face interaction like in, in person, uh, we use that for those for those reasons. Also for some of the subspecialists that they did not need to be at bedside. For instance, if uh, the internal medicine is getting counsel from infectious disease, they're talking about the case, they're reviewing the labs uh, or some other consults, we use that for those purposes. Uh, most of our usage was in our outpatient clinics. Okay, got it. So now, about post COVID, uh, post -COVID uh, I mean, I feel like uh, the technology, now that, uh, uh, you know, we had a reason to push this, you know, and bring it out faster uh, because of COVID, I think physicians and our uh, clinical operation, they started uh, realizing the value. Uh, I think there's a still a room for the technology post COVID that we can leverage, you know, as a pediatrician, there are so many cases that, you know, I can, I can see without parents bringing the child to the clinic. For instance, if a child has a rash and yeah. some other symptoms that are, they don't need to bring them to the clinic, why would I want them to bring the child uh, and expose them to other sick uh, children sitting in the, in the waiting room? So now, especially with the advancement of your phone and your iPad cameras on them, right? Uh, once we conduct a session, it's so much easier to visualize that. And if there's any doubt, we always ask them to bring it to the clinic or send them to the emergency room. That makes sense. So one of the things is like uh, I probably get like um, a daily some Wall Street analysts ask me like just asking. So they're all, everyone predicting you know regarding to stock prices or Teladoc, American Wall Street. Right? So say like you know right now the COVID have a bump in there, right? If it's COVID, does that curve look like you know, flatten out like in terms of telehealth adoption? Is, does it trend downward and settle into some place, or does it continue going up? What's your, uh, what's, your, what's your prediction? I think it's all about uh, mm -hmm. uh, recepting the technology. And I think <clears throat> what we're going to see is uh, different institutions are going to use this differently. Okay. I mean, 10 years ago, when I was at University of Pittsburgh, uh, uh, we were the pioneers in, in those type of technology. One of the reason was uh, UPMC has its own health plan, so mm -hmm. we were not worried really about uh, the other insurance that are going to pay for the service. But also, uh, we were really good with technology and physician leads that they were part of this. So I think one of the things that's going to happen is uh, we're going to see some institutions are going to leverage this more than the others because during the pandemic, they really uh, tested the technology and they really compare in different clinical settings and, and they saw the value of, of this. Now, the problem is going to happen if uh, we're going to lose some of the payment plan that, you know, some of the restriction that the uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services mm -hmm. during the pandemic. If those restrictions are going to be put back in place, obviously we're going to have a little bit of problems. And that makes a lot of sense. And then it's also the payment will move the needle. <laughs> yes. We have an uh, interesting question from Zach. So he's asking, essentially the context is, right, so if you have these sort of virtual waiting room, all these pieces, right, there's while the patient's waiting, so today they're not doing anything. So he's asking is from the media marketing perspective, uh, what do you think about placing this ad, like the video ad in front of the patient and the healthcare provider, you know, as they have these sort of 
telehealth experience. Like, what's your feeling about that? So between the time that the patient is in a waiting room and the and then the and it's waiting for a physician to join the room to yeah, have an app on the screen. Yeah, my hunch is could be while during the. I think there's. If I were to guess, Zach, I apologize if I miss, But if I were to interpret the question, I'll say when he is while the patient and the healthcare provider before they have a session there on the platform, you can show some app. So the other piece is while during the conversation, and maybe there is various relevant other material that could be served out, or maybe after they see and visit some additional video content played out. I mean, certainly it's an interesting idea. Uh, uh, the only thing is that, you know, as I mentioned in one of my slides, our average visit was about seven minutes. Uh, okay. So um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's interesting. And I think if, if you can think of some educational tools that is relevant to those practices, but also from a technological standpoint, uh, my question is always like, um, uh, many years ago, the video session would take a huge bandwidth, and and now with all this uh, advances in technology, we have reduced that. So uh, the only thing is that if is if you're adding additional uh, workload into the session, is it going to really put more on? Uh, uh, is it going to use more bandwidth on on the session and create interruption? Mm -hmm. That that's that's one thing I would add. Uh, ask and the, the second thing is that what are some of the content that we were looking um, because for me the seven minute visit it's pretty fast okay. uh, so if I'm putting additional contents in between because we want to we want to replicate the regular workflow in the yeah. clinic so as soon as the CA finish the doctor will go in maybe 30 seconds uh, there in between or a minute but I think certainly it's 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 a, it's a good idea to explore options Okay, I got it. Okay. The reason that my hunch was Zach is asking is sometimes these content are uh, sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies. So some people feel like you know, making sure it's not like you know, overly advertising or maybe find the right grade. Are we going to charge those content to offset some of the cost of VC? Uh, I think there could be. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about <laughs> it. So, yeah, in fact, we see we do have an a, a engine that actually you could do content through different pharmaceutical companies, but you could also serve out, for example, from your hospital, you could put out relevant content before the visit happens. I think um, Saturday is an interesting idea. I think even if from the hospital perspective, I mean, again, you got to look at your statistics, you know, what is my average time and what is my yeah. wait time? Because you can also yeah. do a wait time report. If the wait time is it's, it's long and there's no way we can uh, uh, change the operation. You can certainly talk about your hospital, right? Um, yeah. Yes. So uh, we have a question for Alan asking, so on a, like a practical level, um, so do you, like how many hours do you have to deal with these, you know, like these are more like the technical support type of things, making sure someone has a microphone or camera, and do you have uh, an in-house technical support team that sort of support your, the operation. So the way I, I, I usually go about the project is to follow the uh, project management process. Again, the first slide. So I have a team in place and I work with IT. Uh, my department, Clinical Informatics, works with our IT department. So um, before we went live, we identified all the areas that needs to have a camera and microphone. We also engage our compliance to ensure patient privacy. And we went about and tested all the stations to ensure that they're working. We created we created a cheat sheet instruction to put it on every station because when people come for an hour of training on how to use VC, and this is certainly not day-to-day -day practice. By the time they come back to use it, they might have forgotten how to log in, how to where to click. So we really summarized the entire process in two pages and put it on every station for them, put a laminated uh, paper. We had uh, three way of support. Uh, the first line is that every department that we implemented the technology, I asked them to give me uh, a, a champion. So a physician champion for every department is the first person to go to. Um, and the second line is the phone number we provided. So we have a, a service from eight to five. And since it's mostly outpatient, so we don't need after hour support. And they would call that number 
I was also available since a lot of physicians, you know, don't call IT or call the support and they always call me or text me directly. Uh, I had the master login access to our VC platform. So if mm -hmm. they forgot to set up their password or they want to reset immediately, they just text me and I just pull up my laptop and I fix it for them. And we didn't really have any technical problem besides some area in the hospital that where they used try to use Wi-Fi. Um, the, the, some of the sessions were kind of broken, but that is the problem with our Wi-Fi connectivity and mm -hmm. not really technology. So with uh, especially having the champion in every division, we found out that it is extremely helpful. Okay, that's yeah, thanks for that. So um, Yahya um, is asking for the questions. So, He's asking, so um, have you developed any remote patient monitoring solutions or your things like you know, really you know, pull on data beyond just video of a patient? So we, we were thinking about that, especially with our uh, inmate population. So uh, we just purchased uh, uh, full telemedicine technology from VC and we're looking into uh, integrating some of the devices through iHealth that they provide. Uh, for our patient tracking. Uh, it's a little bit more complex, um, you know, because then you have to look into how you want to integrate it with your current EMR versus yeah. uh, you want to upload those information on, on the VC platform. So, but this is certainly what uh, we're looking at right now with our inmate population. Got it. That is great. Okay. So, I have a question from David uh, asking so, when you onboard a new physician or a nurse, like just how much time do you allocate for you know, training for like you know from this new provider to feel comfortable become like a you know really good at telehealth? So we only spend about thirty minutes, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, again, efficiency and simplicity. We try to focus on the area they need to to uh, uh, work on, uh, and uh, thirty minutes of uh, uh, discussion over different platform mm -hmm. uh, that we have on the fit front face, patient facing, and, and the physician facing, and, and literally a demo. And again, our institution, we have a number of residents and fellows. They're running 80% of, 90% of uh, our clinical practice. And you know, these generations, they know the technology really well. Uh, sometimes I send them my slide deck and they come to the session uh, for our training, they already know everything. They already okay. tested the system in our Test environment. I just need to set up their username, and they're good to go. Got it. Got it. So within this is actually great to hear that you can change. That. Now within your provider, do you find that um, is there a pattern for people that a provider that gain you know, like the five star rating from the patient versus maybe like four or three stars? And is there like do you find like for the people who get maybe three or four star, is there you know additional training or what type of training that could get you know, everyone to like the five star? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the challenges with uh, providers is, uh, especially when the COVID, uh, uh, the number of cases increased, uh, when some of the providers that they were more senior and they wanted to see the technology, see patient from home, uh, then they had to use the technology themselves. When they were on campus, the residents were the one who initiated the session and they were using it, but now they're at home they don't have that resources. So I thought, I think that was the challenging part for some of our providers that all of a sudden they had to use the technology that they, they basically sat in the class for training. They use it once or twice. The rest were done by residents and fellows. And then all of a sudden they, 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 they faced the situation that, oh, now I have to see the patient myself. Where is mm -hmm. that cheat sheet? What is the number we need to call them? And I think that was, that was a challenge some of the most uh, more senior attending space. Got it, okay. So I have a question from Amit. Uh, so he said he's a CTO of a you know, big uh, uh, healthcare system. So they say they're doing before, uh, you know, the, they're doing about like 2000 sessions per week, you know, by telehealth. Then now with the COVID, you know, like they're doing about, about sort of like, uh, <clears throat> uh, I guess it was the beginning, they do about 20% at least for 2,000 sessions per week with telehealth. So now the, about 95% are telehealth. So he's asking is, so between the different departments you have, is there a certain department that have a lot more adoption than other? And then the second part is, uh, what is the 
best case scenario, like what do you, is, you know, do you expect in you know, a pediatric uh, surgeon percent to telehealth access rate? And then some other department maybe higher or lower. Because what is the norm for like adoption? So uh, talking historically, I always anticipate that someone like uh, psychiatry uh, would be the best, would be the yeah. highest, because uh, even over a decade ago when I was building the technology, um, we didn't need any diagnostic medical equipment, right? Mm -hmm. We just need a face-to-face -face visit, HIPAA secure face-to-face -face visit. Yeah. Um, so um, I think it, it depends on the providers and, and the champion in each institution, because my I was hoping that in my institution also I see that number to be the highest, but I saw that my internal medicine was actually the highest, followed by family medicine, and now I'm looking at every, every week. I'm looking at the trend, and you know, when I have meeting with our medical executive committee and department chairs, I bring the, the statistic to the meeting, and it's interesting now. My maternal fetal medicine is like going up. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I think it all goes back to um, uh, how much the providers uh, are buying into technology and how much they're willing to use it. If all my providers and physician champions were tech savvy, I would say that I would see number one would be psychiatry, mm -hmm. number two would be the primary care, and number three would be more of a sub specialties. Specialties. So uh, I don't see much in my general surgery, but I see a lot in my neurosurgery, which again mm -hmm. to me it, it's very interesting. My neurosurgery is uh, having a lot more follow-up session with their patient through VC than my general surgery, which I thought the number would have been uh, reversed. So when mm -hmm. I present this in medical executive committee, uh, sometimes it's interesting to see that uh, uh, we see like uh, internal medicine is like number one right now. Got it. Okay. This is really, yeah. Thanks for sharing the insight. So we have a question from Mohammed uh, asking. So. Uh, uh, have you got any complaints from patients that uh, like the provider made some mistake over telemedicine? Again, the premise for this, right? You know, in person, you have all these in-person exams and so on. But when you're doing telemedicine, often you're very limited to just, you know, the medical history plus the video. Um, no, I think uh, 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 the, 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 the problem that we had with uh, some of our patient is to how to really use the technology okay. uh, because uh, you know when we uh, see a patient remotely and they're not used to it, especially older population uh, and, and, and I try to uh, when I do my training with uh, the care assistant and medical assistant I try to uh, have them use some of the examples that they may use in normal life for instance if you're teaching your patient that are 65 uh, 65, 70 years old, try to use some of the examples that they use in their regular life, in, in their normal life. For instance, uh, do you do and do you have any grandchildren? Yes. Do you guys use any FaceTime? Anything that you see your grandchildren? And try to leverage some of their normal uh, life uh, mm -hmm. pattern to replace it with the technology. Uh, that is a complaint that usually they have is, uh, how do I use this? And when you simplify that for them, uh, uh, it, it, it works so much better. Now, some of the patients, they do not like this type of technology. You know, they, they like to come and see their doctors face to face. Even, even if the camera is face to face, they still like to have that, you know, welcoming and shaking hands and, you know, old fashioned. So unfortunately we can't change that. Um, but, you know, uh, but teaching them and, and helping them and simplifying this, and again, it goes back to one of the features that we're not using app is a huge plus that they don't need to download anything because that would have made things even more complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think helping them to walk through the technology and ease this step uh, is, is the part that some of our patients are asking us to do for them. Got it. So then do you, um, I guess, do you develop a medical guideline for your providers in terms of, you know, here's a set of conditions you need to do it in person, here's the set you could do video, is that done by individual departments or physicians? So as part of our analysis, again, as part of the workflow analysis in the beginning, uh, we sat down with them and uh, I asked them, what are some of the scenarios that you think 
uh, we need to have these people uh, on the telemedicine. It's feasible. And this part is actually very challenging because you have to bypass some of the other steps. Normally, when the new patient comes to the hospitals, they call the call center. The call center assign them to different specialties. Once they come to the specialty, let's say the patient comes and see a family medicine doctor, the family medicine doctor will schedule the next visit through their own clinic. So it, it will be extremely challenging to, to train the call center which patient goes through in person, which patient goes through the phone visit, which patient goes through the telemedicine. So what we did in the initial phase, we removed the call center from our, our, uh, uh, to make an appointment for telemedicine uh, at all cost. So they just schedule a patient for our clinic visit. Uh, the medical directors put the setup information for the nurse triage so that when the patients are calling and we're scheduling them, they can talk with them and inquire about their uh, upcoming visit. And basically, they kind of filter them as this mm -hmm. person is the coming visit, or uh, we also have a video platform. And last things, but not the least thing, we try to switch all of our telephone visits to video platform. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense in there. So right now, like one of the trend, like in the general, I guess, especially on the for-profit side of telemedicine, are company like Roman, Hims, you know, GoodRx, Hey Doctor, and so on. In fact, Hims, I think they just became a public traded company last week, you know, like billions of dollars and so on. And their model is they're not even doing video visit. They just have the patient fill out some questionnaire. And from the questionnaire, then the doctor, some doctor review the write a prescription. Like for that one, do you see that is something that you want to augment your existing thing? Or do you feel that type of practice is maybe a, like medically, you just don't have enough information, it's really maybe too risky? Or... I think, I mean, I personally like technology. I mean, uh, I mean I'm a CMIO here. Uh, that is not something that uh, everybody likes, you know, for the providers. I mean, the challenge is that technology is changing much faster than healthcare is adapting to. Uh, and I think the bigger, the biggest um, challenge that uh, physician informaticians or uh, you know, folks in the C-suite, chief technology officer, chief strategic officers, uh, chief information officers are facing is that how do we go about educating the needs, not only to our system, but also to our providers? Because at the end of the day, um, um, those providers, the clinic operations, are the one who's going to use this technology. So I'm always open to look into the trends and, and see you know, what is out there that can um, provide better patient care for my community and, uh, and what are some of the options that I can embed into my sister system that uh, uh, my providers would utilize. So there's always that balance that I have to keep in mind uh, going about any changes that uh, I see on the news or, you know, the, 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 uh, the technology trends in different parts of the country. Um, great. So I have a question from the Get More. Uh, so she's asking, you know, like, you know, like she just using Zoom for video call with her patients in there. Like, of course, that's really easy. She doesn't need to do anything. Just like just send all these links in there. Like, what do you gain from going through, you know, set up a whole telehealth program versus just like, everybody to download Zoom and to Zoom calls? So as I said, uh, it really depends on your clinical practice. Uh, it really depends on what your workflow is. Uh, if you, maybe you're a social worker and you just want to set up a call and talk to someone directly, it might work for them uh, uh, that they have that kind of platform. The way I see uh, uh, the technology that worked for us, I really want to replicate the clinical practice okay. so that I eliminate uh, uh, unnecessary step to train and I can have my team to continue to use the technology. Uh, this, is, this, is the, this is like the rule number one that when we, I have in my book that every time you introduce a technology, try to stay, stick to your current workflow as much as you can unless you are changing your workflow for better needs. In introducing two separate workflow is not going to be yeah. So the way I want to create my workflow was if the patient is coming to the, when the patient comes to the clinic, 
they go to the front desk to register, right? Then uh, they sit down, they get called in by the MA or CA to go into the room, check their vitals, fill out the questionnaires, uh, put some information in the medical record, and then they said, doctor will be with you shortly. Then the doctor will go to the room, visit the patient. Mm -hmm. If they need to have any follow-up, uh, for instance, to get the nurse in the room, like in my case, the child had, you know, needs uh, additional support or not, uh, or I'm done with the session. Um, that, that's one uh, workflow. In the academic medical center, sometimes you get the intern or residents to see the patient. You want to do round on the patient, you know, family center round, or you want to bring the subspecialist or the attending into the conversation. All of those combined, I want to create a system that uh, is very close to that. Yeah. So Zoom wouldn't do that for me. WebEx wouldn't do that for me. And we have institutional account with them that we use for other purposes. But looking at the vendors, uh, VC did that for us. So when I have the session that the care assist go and see the patient and ask those questions and said, the doctor will be with you shortly, the care assist can leave the session, but still keep the patient on the cloud, on the waiting room. And then the doctor will log in, go see the patient. Also, if this is done through my residence, they can send the link to the providers, to the attending. So the attending can join the room. And then when they talk to the patient, they can leave the room. Same thing with some specialists. They can do that as well. Some may argue that, you know, we might be able to, we can do that with the Zoom as well. But for me, the workflow is so much easier because yeah. we tried Zoom so, uh, prior to going to BC. And it was very cumbersome because you have to also almost like a scheduling a meeting. But yeah. this is like on the fly. You just send them to yeah. the text message and the session is there. Also with Zoom, the other challenge is that with this platform is that you need, uh, you have a limitation is in terms of number of sessions that you can schedule per uh, hour versus if I'm giving an uh, account uh, to my surgery clinic and my MA is covering general surgery, uro urology, ENT, and ophthalmology at the same time, those doctors can see the uh, uh, different patient at the same time, so they don't have that limitation either. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, so Sam is asking us, what, uh, for your patients, what percentage of them uses like mobile versus desktop? I would say that almost 100% of our patients use the text messaging feature, which goes to their cell phone. Got it. Okay. So very much. How about on the providers? So for you, provider, do you train them all? Do you tell them they have to sit in a nice office for a lot? Or do the provider will also do telemedicine call on their mobile? Those nice and fancy offices only in Gray's Anatomy, right? My <laughs> providers are always on the run. It's either their cell phone or we have a charting room that they're sharing with number of people at the same time. And so we have a dedicated computers in every charting room. Uh, with a camera and a headphone for privacy, uh, but also um, some of the providers that are uh, program directors, sometimes uh, they go back to their office to see the patients, we provide service for them. Uh, but I also have providers that uh, they said they use their cell phone in the hospital. Yeah, <laughs> got it, that makes sense. Uh, we have a question from Scott. He's asking, so now I have done so much already. If you could go back and do it over again, like what would you do differently based on your, now what you learn? Um, I don't think we would do much differently. I think as an organization as a whole, I think if, if I raise that question at a higher level, I think my, um, uh, you know, our operation team uh, and uh, some of our executive probably uh, would have, done some steps differently and 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 um uh and those would be you know we need to have you know in your institution you need to ensure that there's a great collaboration mm -hmm. between different pieces so just because my department did a thorough uh, uh, evaluation in the beginning we got the vendor in place uh we got our it on board uh, and we got our physician trained um, um, that is still not enough. You need mm -hmm. to ensure that every member of the uh, system work collaboratively together. 
uh, uh, for instance, who, who is in charge of your registration? Who is in charge of your scheduling? That may be under totally different administrators that you need to ensure they're aligned with each other. And I, I wouldn't really blame my administration on that, on that too, if I were to do it again. I think the challenge with COVID was it was fast, fast uh, yeah. and we lost a lot of the staff. Yeah. Uh, and that was the challenge for the registration team because if my MA or CA is going to look into, uh, is working on getting the patient into the room as part of the in-person visit, but also we're asking them to set up a patient through VC. I mean, if you don't have enough staff, that's not just feasible. Yeah. So if I were to go back, that's a really good question for our legislature uh, as a whole that, you know, the telemedicine was very stagnant for years in the United yeah. States when you compare to Canada and Europe and the rest of, rest of the world. And if COVID wasn't there, I don't think we would be here today. Yeah. So I think the lesson learned is that the technology should be welcomed faster than what we have done in the past mm -hmm. and how we can work together uh, you know, as a nation to really incorporate that into our healthcare system. And doctor, thank you so much for your time. By the way, I apologize, there's a still bunch of questions and audience that we didn't get to, but we'll give this answer or post on the web page. As we close closing, maybe I could just ask you some three really quick rapid fire questions. Um, so the, the first thing is, you know, as a physician and, you know, IT experts in this, what was something that you um, find that's really surprising about sort of telehealth? So, I think the surprising part was how readily system have embraced uh, the system, our healthcare system, okay. have embraced telehealth in all areas of medicine. This uh, would not have happened without pandemic uh, forcing this issue. Yeah. Got it. So the next thing is, um, so now you are one of the experts in the industry in there. What is something that, like there's one thing that you believe about telehealth for the rest of the world do not believe yet. Well, I'm not sure about no one else uh, because I think those of us in telehealth all realize all realize this potential. I think there are a lot of people uh, that have been in this uh, uh, in healthcare industry and technology that they're very aware of these challenges. But there are still executives and physicians that do, they do not understand how useful. The telehealth can be in the practice of medicine and how uh, uh, quality medicine can be delivered this way so i think a lot of us it's just not you know uh, uh, specifically limits to me that uh, people think that we need to have more providers and executive on board as part of this effort great and the final question is um, uh, if you have a magic wand uh, you can make uh, one big change to American healthcare system. Maybe even, for example, I know President Biden, he's very active in digital health. He's always come to speak at like startup health. I remember sitting in the front row with him. Right? Like, what will you whisper into his ear? Like, then he'll do something big in healthcare. What would be that one thing? Only if I had a magic wand, right? <laughs> <laughs> So I think uh, technology is changing much faster than uh, what the healthcare is adapting to. I think there needs to be uh, education on the use of informatics in the delivery of healthcare, uh, on the use of electronic medical records. I think there needs to be more integration of the providers in choosing the technology uh, that a hospital uses as they are ultimately the ones using it to provide care. Uh, mm -hmm. There needs to be much higher value placed on using clinical informaticians in healthcare system. I mean, in my hospital, I have clinical informatic rotations and I, you know, we have a school of medicine here, CUSM, California University of Science and Medicine. Mm -hmm. And we have St. George's University uh, students over here and all of our residency and fellows. So uh, we have a students uh, rotate through my clinical informatic rotation. Yeah. We have now a fellowship in clinical informatic rotation across the country. And so I think that the sooner we inter integrate some of this uh, knowledge into their medical curriculum, and also bringing our next generation of medical students and residents up to speed with the changes in technology and introduce them to those. I think this is going to uh, help our healthcare system tremendously over the next decade. Awesome. 
Again, thank you, Doctor, for your really insightful presentation and wisdom in this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. So we'll be sending out the recording and the slides following this session. And also, please take our, our survey as you lead the webinar. We always love to hear from you so we can improve how in this. And then we're again looking forward to joining us on the next Telehealth Secrets webinar. Again, thank you again, Doctor. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Safe. Have a wonderful day. Thanks.